Thank you so much, Dr. Preek, for that very enlightening conversation about challenges in treatment. Uh, of course, uh, that's a topic that we're all very interested in. Hopefully, we can learn more in the future. Um, uh, my part of the panel will be about clinical trials overall uh, for cancer and uh, the challenges, uh, particularly for uh, you know, diverse uh, populations and minority groups. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Dr. Arturo Loaiza Bonilla. I am a medical oncologist uh, in Philadelphia and also the vice chairman of the Department of Medical Oncology and enterprise director of research at Cancer Treatment Centers of America, which is a network of five hospitals across the U.S. focusing on cancer care. So um, today we are going to have a conversation. Uh, hopefully you find it interesting and, and uh, you, you can draw some conclusions and next steps for the future. These are my disclosures here, as you know. So um, we have discussed extensively throughout this uh, CME conversation about how difficult cancer is. And these are just a quick reminder of the worldwide cancer statistics. Uh, cancer is the leading cause of death worldwide, uh, bearing COVID uh, these days, uh, unfortunately. Um, but we have about 18.1 million cases per year, uh, which uh, that number increasing year by year. And uh, not only that, but there's also significant mortality from that, uh, even though we have done some strides in the improvement on the war against cancer. And cancer affects everyone, as we know, but uh, we wanna focus today on uh, some diverse populations. So I'm gonna be discussing uh, how clinical trial um, is difficult, not only for overall cancer patients as a whole, which is very underrepresented uh, across the board, but how um, you know, Hispanic patients and African-American patients have um, very much difficulty getting access to uh, clinical trials. And I, I will just give you a, a few background uh, points uh, for your uh, information. And so cancer is the leading cause of death among Hispanics. And as you can see, followed by heart diseases and accidents. Uh, but uh, unlike other populations of patients, uh, cancer is really the one that is leading uh, for, for death and something that is a major element need for those patients. In terms of what are the most common cancers that they uh, get affected by, uh, of course, there's many common cancers across uh, you know, humankind, uh, but for uh, different populations, there are certain risk factors, uh, environmental and, uh, and others that could affect that. Uh, in, um, in the case of uh, males, it's prostate, colon, and rectum. We're focusing on GI malignancies, which is my focus of expertise, but this applies to uh, all kinds of cancer uh, 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 types, tumor types. Uh, in women, breast, uh, thyroid, uterine, and also colorectal cancer is a major one. Other ones in the GI space uh, are pancreas cancer and stomach cancer. Some progress has been made to increase survival, uh, and all of this is because of research, clinical trials, new developments coming our way, and sometimes increased screening. Uh, however, the incidence uh, and death rates still remain significant uh, for Hispanics uh, over the last uh, two decades. And many of them have been attributed to modified risk factors. So less smokers, more obesity. Uh, so it decreases the chances of lung cancer, but increases the chances of other malignancies such as colon cancer or pancreas or esophageal cancer. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, move the needle forward and better uh, for uh, those patients. Uh, one major issue that happens in uh, diverse populations is the less uh, access to care. And because of that, they're less likely to consider cancer screening. And when uninsured, the numbers are dismal. Uh, as you can see here, compared to non-Hispanic white populations, uh, the numbers are very, very different uh, from uh, across all uh, you know, age groups uh, and even Hispanic subgroups. Let's talk about uh, cancer in African-American populations. So now we talk about Hispanics. So, uh, African-American patients also have a significant burden from cancer. Uh, and these are the leading sites of new cancer deaths uh, and cases among blacks in 2019. Uh, mostly uh, prostate and breast take the, the most of them, including lung cancer as well, because there's a history of smoking as well. Uh, but colorectal cancer, pancreas cancer, uh, take also a very uh, major toll in uh, that patient population. When we look at the trends in death rates, this is specifically for colon and rectal cancer. You can see uh, black population compared to white non-Hispanic population. Uh, the uh, uh, incidence and in death uh, is significant for uh, the African-American patient population. And uh, this could be related not only to smoking, but also trends in obesity prevalence. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 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 black uh, females 
have a significant proportion of obesity uh, in uh, compared to the non uh, Hispanic white uh, females and males, and that may contribute to some of the risk factors for uh, cancer. Uh, and the other thing is the screening, right? So we can see here in this table, the colorectal cancer screening uh, in adults 45 years and older, which is the currently recommended age for screening uh, based on the latest guidelines. And you can notice as well, as we had mentioned for this Hispanic population, that uh, the proportion of you know, colonoscopies or being things up to date, even though they're pretty bad across all uh, uh, different um, uh, ethnicities and, and races, uh, still, have uh, a major impact, at least 10% uh, or less uh, well, compared to um, white non-Hispanic populations. Uh, the same happens with uh, LGBT populations and uh, also immigration status uh, and income level has uh, a role in insurance access and opportunities for treatment. So why am I giving this uh, background on this? Because as we know, clinical trials is part of, of uh, the treatment of our patients and this is the reasons why they may, you know, contribute to a heavier burden of cancer and why there's, it's so important to have them included in clinical trials. Um, so uh, in the past, we used to think as cancer as a, you know, uh, single entity that we treated as a monolithic approach with the same drugs, but now we know personalized medicine is, is the way to go for oncology. And um, this is just uh, showing you the difference between, you know, what we call before the phenotype approach and now the genotype approach, where we're looking at the genomics of DNA of the cancer in making a difference. And um, now that we have this, this ability to discern between biomarkers and genomics, uh, it's a time to move on from, you know, um, any inclusion criteria differently than, than that and uh, promote diversity in clinical trials because it's really showing us how uh, this has an impact uh, overall in cancer care. So as I mentioned, traditional terminal cancer, uh, it was same stage and location, same treatment, but now we have precision oncology, which is you know, different tumor profile, could be different, different treatments. Uh, so same place of cancer, different treatment based on genomics, on biomarkers, and the same uh, for different place, same treatment. So if they have the same biomarker uh, across different places, we can still treat them uh, with the same drug that hopefully uh, follows the same oncotype um, uh, or the same oncogene addiction phenomenon. In terms of biomarkers, we know there's a tremendous variety of biomarkers and that is even more relevant across uh, diverse populations. So everyone is different and cancer is unique as we know for every single one of us. Um, but uh, it's even more relevant when we look at the microcosm of biomarkers and translate it into the diversity of patients, uh, such as uh, uh, minority populations. We need to understand much more how this impacts because that's why we are making strides in cancer because we're really making it granular. We're understanding the underpinnings of all those. Uh, why? Because we have many options now. We have cytotoxic chemotherapy, we have targeted treatments, uh, we have immune therapy approaches, and all of them have biomarkers that are leading uh, to predict who is going to respond to that or not. And we need to understand better what populations of patients have the best uh, opportunities and which ones could be optimized or changed uh, so we can make it uh, much more efficient and cost effective as well for the health uh, system. Uh, we know that overall survival could be uh, optimized by and also sometimes quality of life by uh, when you do biomarker match therapies. Uh, for example, the Keynote 177 that was just presented in ESMO uh, showed that not, not only patients with MSI high colorectal cancer benefit from uh, um, you know, immune checkpoint inhibitors in first line compared to chemotherapy, but not only have better survival, but they have better quality of life. So uh, in you know, MSI high tumors, they are different uh, depending on populations of patients, and that includes uh, diversity populations. This is not new, uh, but uh, uh, there is a number of initiatives or folks trying to make awareness. This is all for the reason in the push for this, because we understand how important is in this time and age is to have a broader group of individuals joining clinical trials. So the FDA has a specific group uh, for racial, racial and ethnic minorities in clinical trials group. And uh, a stat just a couple of months ago mentioned clinical trials that include other minority participants and provided some framework, which I'll be happy to share as well as part of my perspective and the others uh, who have uh, been part of this journey. So oncology clinical trials, minorities, uh, uh, it's why is it important? Because clinical trials, as we know, are the mainstay of the development and validation of cancer treatments and options. Despite the potential for access to new treatments, uh, less than uh, one in 20 adult patients with cancer participate in a clinical trial. 
These disparities even worse for racial and ethnic minorities, as I mentioned. Uh, they are showing that in the last 14 years, uh, it's basically in the single digits, so it's pretty dismal. Um, so quick um, reminder here uh, of the population of uh, you know, the United States, 72% uh, Caucasian, Hispanic 16%, African American 12%. That's about to change in the next uh, uh, you know, uh, half of a decade, half of the century, I mean. Um, and clinical participation is much more uh, favored towards Caucasian population, 94%. So uh, we've seen that clinical trials do not represent uh, the, the diversity of our population, even in the US. Uh, so something that we should uh, do better. Uh, in 2012, only 17% of patients enrolled in industry-sponsored trials uh, in, uh, in terms of racial of, or ethnic minority, uh, despite being one third of the whole population in the US. And in terms of uh, black populations, uh, it was 10% uh, only for 31 cancer drug study. And uh, clinical trial participants are disproportionately non-Hispanic white men with higher education levels and household incomes. So uh, it's something that certainly could be improved. Uh, and this is not just uh, my assessment. This is uh, presented at the bioconference and, and others. You're showing the disparities have the implications for precision medicine as we approach, you know, the crossover point when in uh, 2060, uh, when non Caucasians uh, will outnumber Caucasians in the United States. That means that we're going to have a broader, more diverse population of patients. We need to reflect that into our clinical trials uh, so we can really, you know, make cost effective approaches and, and serve everyone that we're trying to help. Um, the implications for lack of diversity. So first of all, we, when you have a skewed enrollment and participation, conclusions of clinical trials may question, particularly as we look into the future and uh, make decisions in terms of how generalizable results could be. Uh, as racial and ethnic minorities uh, uh, carry some high risk burdens in cancer in the United States, uh, we need to understand how to help them better uh, by including them so it's the relevant population. And it's essential so we can develop good treatments for the right patient and that are effective, tolerable, because everyone has different, you know, pharmacogenomic profiles as well that, that could be reflected by that diversity. So what are the recurring themes of how we overcome this uh, in the future? I will discuss that in a minute. The first one is trust. So trust in medical providers has been a major, uh, you know, barrier uh, because they uh, may not understand uh, why we're doing this uh, research. Uh, and it, this is a historical thing as many things that we're doing these days uh, from the Tuskegee uh, syphilis study and forced sterilization in segregated hospitals. Distrust has been a major problem for um, enrollment and trust into the medical care. Um, one study, for example, look into barriers for cancer research uh, reported that one third of black women surveyed say that scientists cannot be trusted compared to 4% of white women. And that could be exacerbated by lack of minority investigators. So if they don't see uh, someone that they identify themselves with, uh, they may not feel comfortable. And I can tell you from my personal experience, uh, a lot of my patients who uh, are Spanish speaking or uh, uh, have a Hispanic background, they can relate way more and they have a major acceptance when you're able to understand their cultural background and understand uh, how we're going to help them too. The other one is access and knowledge. So. Uh, the knowledge about clinical trials is very limited. People don't understand what that means or they, they don't want to be guinea pigs. They don't understand that uh, treatments uh, not necessarily are sham or placebos. Uh, and we need to uh, give them their education on that across the board. Uh, and uh, other thing is uh, we have uh, noticed um, based on many studies that one study in black women, for example, almost all participants said their doctor never talked to them about a clinical trial. So uh, I think we as physicians have a responsibility to be also acquainted about clinical trials. This is not just a patient uh, advocacy burden. It's something that we as physicians need to be on top of and be always thinking about them as we're thinking about our families, right? So if I have a family member with cancer, I want to have them all the options available and that includes clinical trials. I want to look at the best options, the latest things, because that's how we can advance the health for uh, my family member and for others uh, to come. Uh, and that leads to a question of unconscious bias, right? So within the medical community, it could hinder trial recruitment. We may not even suggest to patients that a clinical trial is an option if they assume patients are not interested or we have an assumption that they don't want to hear about it. So we have to give the benefit of the doubt as well. So social determinants of health, uh, probably you have heard about this term, but it's also personalized medicine. Uh, so 
those include factors like socioeconomic status, education, neighborhood, physical environment. All of them play a role in true accrual in clinical trials and for care overall. If we address those uh, SODH, uh, uh, we can uh, improve health uh, and reduce longstanding disparities in health and healthcare. So uh, something to be mindful of. And for those who are not familiar or want a refresher of what those are, uh, you can check them in this graph. Um, so as you can see, there's multifactorial things sometimes we, pick, we take for granted, but they're very important uh, and can make difference for someone to uh, join a clinical trial or not. So we have to be mindful of that. And that leads to trial logistics and costs. So repeated uh, to look, uh, trial criteria and sites, uh, which is what we call trial logistics. Uh, when people plan clinical trials, they may open them always at the same place, and that may be a challenge because you know that doesn't represent the population we're looking for in a diverse way. Or the clinical trials, they always have the same criteria. They need to adapt, right? So that's something that they feel uh, should be improved. Uh, costs remain a significant barrier to clinical trial participation. So sometimes just things like parking, right? How to get a patient to um, get extra lab work or have a caregiver to come and see them and help them out when they have a long day of uh, PK draws uh, throughout the day and they cannot skip a full day of work. So all those things should be considered as part of the clinical trials, not only budget, but support for patients and try to find ways to overcome this. We don't want to coerce patients into be part of clinical trials, but we also have to be mindful that some patients need support and that's how we can uh, do this better. So we need to improve that from the regulatory perspective uh, so they understand uh, why uh, some patients need extra support. So possible solutions, workforce. So we need to uh, improve diversity in the physician workforce, which is a long-term process. Uh, it requires a lot of effort, but we're getting there to some extent. Uh, and hopefully the population uh, drift as well in terms of uh, um, uh, diversity can also help to drive that to some uh, on an you know organic way. Uh, cost, uh, as I mentioned, expanding trials into community cancer centers and having appropriate budgets to support patients uh, and their providers and also caregivers, it's very important. And access and knowledge, we need to make a campaign to improve access and understanding of clinical trials. Everyone should be offered a clinical trial, no matter what the condition have, if there's one open and available within a certain mouse radio of the patient, or if we can open a just-in-time trial site, which is something I'm very passionate about as well, where we can bring the trial to the patient. Uh, now we have technologies, we have drones, we have telehealth, uh, we have uh, uh, opportunities to uh, check patients while they're at home and do virtual trials. We should try to strive for this, and it's likely going to decrease costs, drive innovation, and help patients to get access, including minority patients. So the FDA has some strategies for enhanced diversity. So uh, this is a draft guidance here for your reference. Uh, hopefully uh, we can continue to engage with the FDA and other regulatory bodies so we can improve access to uh, clinical trials across the board, but also uh, be mindful of the uh, differences across uh, diverse populations. Uh, some strategies that have been done uh, are listed here. This is for the Kaiser Foundation. Uh, so link members to social services, assess social needs, use community health workers, uh, assist just involved uh, with community integration, et cetera, and assistance programs. So um, we can really uh, make a difference to improve their overall health and care and access, and hopefully that will uh, translate as well into clinical trial enrollment. Uh, last is technology. So clinical trials are looking for digital health tools uh, that have been limited by showing some positive impacts. Um, mobile cancer apps can be helped uh, for looking for everything, including the social determinants of health, to help the patient to navigate diseases uh, and earn, have an understanding of clinical trials, this clinical trial matching technology tools uh, that also should be uh, incorporated and things that um, we can look for uh, to improve awareness of clinical trials for uh, patients. Uh, and hopefully they're uh, translated into appropriate language uh, and also um, in simple language that folks can understand. Um, so we know there's success on this, uh, so hopefully we can keep uh, doing this effort uh, to improve um, understanding. And I end with this one, which shows you just for the genomic perspective, how many pathways there are. Of course, if we look at the pathways related to immune system response, they're even broader. So uh, it doesn't even include the proteomics. So um, as much as diversity happens at the molecular level and we have been successful in treating cancer, there's also diversity in our patients and something that we should strive for so we can help them to get access to the best options. And with that, I finish. Thank you so much.